Okay, return to Gettysburg. Now, why am I coming back to this game? Well, somebody on Board Game Geek contacted me and made me aware of an article that appeared in Volume 19, Number 3 of the General. Strange thing is, I've had this magazine for years, and I guess I just forgot about the article itself. But it proposes a variant for Intermediate Level Gettysburg called the Gettysburg Compromise. It's by Rick Matthews. And he gives us a system whereby we can use the battle line and column counters in the intermediate level. Basically, it's a two-page article, and it allows brigades to be in line with modifiers when they're being flanked, and column and modifiers when they're being flanked. And he changes a couple of rules, but it's really just a two-page article, and uh, it changes the whole nature of the game. Now, I've been fooling around with it, and I like what I see, but I'm concerned about a few things. And um, I thought it might be fun to just photograph the game as I play it and um, see what's what with this uh, variant. So what I'm going to do is photograph the game as I play it with one hour intervals and um, we'll see how it goes. Now I'm not going to try to explain the rules. You'll see that in the formations. Basically though in the game if you've got a column marker on it, of course you're in column and if you put a battle line marker on it, you're in uh, battle line. Uh, for the cavalry, um, the battle line procedure is slightly different, uh, but you'll see that in the video. The biggest change to the rules from the intermediate are that there's going to be no stacking in this game. So each counter, uh, cavalry and artillery, cavalry and infantry rather, will not be able to stack. And uh, this is just an experiment. Let's see how it goes. Okay, I've begun the game with the 7 a.m. turn Union. Reynolds has marched up 32 squares. He's just south of the town of Gettysburg. That's the headquarters unit for Reynolds. Now, Devon and Gamble have done a very aggressive move. They've got tons of movement points, so they've come down here in column and deployed into line using the little battle line markers. It's a very aggressive move, but they know that Heath's division only has three movement points. And it takes two movement points to change from column to line, so um, Heath's division will be hard pressed to get in line here and be very cramped. That's why these guys are being so aggressive. But let's see what uh, Heath can do. Okay, that's the situation after the Confederates have moved. Now Heath has very few movement points. He's only got three, so the lead unit goes up to the front, changes into line. And you can't come within three hexes of a zone of influence to change, so that's why he changed here. These guys don't have enough movement points to change the line. And I chose the largest brigade to go first, Pettigrews. So um, I don't think Heath has to worry about Devon and Gamble attacking. These guys are double in defense, but not in attacking. But still, they're very cramped coming on on, the t on on turn one, which is what the Union intention is, to try to buy time. Let's do the 8 a.m. turn for the Union. Okay, this is the situation after the Union have moved for 8 a.m. You can see the brigades of Meredith and Cutler have arrived in the vicinity of the Pate's Orchard. They can go 20 squares. So they're coming up very nicely in column. Devon and Gamble are not being afraid of Heath's division at all. They've fallen back just a few hexes. They're trying to contest every inch possible because they know the Heath or Pettigrew's brigade doesn't really want to take them on at double defense, higher ground. These guys still have yet to change to line. So they're buying precious time for the Union. And Reynolds, I just put him at the Lutheran Theological Seminary. So let's see what the Confederates can do for their 8 o'clock turn. Okay, this is the situation after the Confederates have moved. Now they're all in line now. We've got Brock and Brower on the left. We've got Archer in the center with Pegram's artillery. We've got Davis here and Pettigrew, the largest brigade, is attempting to outflank Devon and Gamble, so I don't think they're going to be able to stick around. Let's check the next turn, which is the 9 a.m. turn for the Union. Okay, this is the 9 a.m. turn for the Union. You can see Stone and Wainwright's counters coming up there about at the Peach Orchard. Um, you've got Rowley here, which I always liked. This is one of the first games that had this position of this 
brigade right. Raleigh was kind of lost and veered off to the west. He actually came in on this obscure road here to the west, and they've got that accurately in the game. And uh, two more brigades coming up here. That's um, Paul and Baxter. And uh, the Iron Brigade and Marathon Cutler are in the immediate vicinity now, and Devon and Gamble fell back just a bit. So there actually could be combat if the Confederates want to risk perhaps a one-to-one -one or so. I'll look at the odds. We'll see what they can do. But the Devon and Gamble are being very, very aggressive, taking a lot of chances here. Well, chances. One-to-one -one attack, how chancy is that? Or one-to-one -one defense. Or one-to-two in some cases. So, we'll see what the Confederates can do for the nine o'clock turn. Um, you can see how historical the time record goes now with the new battle line markers. You've got to spread out, you can cover the front better, and uh, you can't stack. So um, we'll see how this goes. Okay, we'll have our first attacks here. I took Pettigrew's brigade and outflanked the Union Cavalry Brigade here of Gamble. And these two guys made a frontal. That's going to be kind of a one-to-one. -one. This one, I'll have to check the odds. They're not going to be great attacks, and in retrospect with the Union, I perhaps should have fallen back at least one, maybe two squares, and avoided this. But that'll give time for the two brigades here of the 1st Division time. But uh, let's catch the action after I've rolled the dice and see what the combat results are. Okay, with the new flanking rules, Pettigrew is going to be doubled, and they're on the same ground, same height. And this is a one-to-one. -one. So we have a two-to-one attack and a one-to-one -one attack. And I think these guys will be able to minus one because they're on higher ground to Devon. So a two-to-one straight and a one-to-one -one minus one. Let's catch the action after the die rolls. Okay, mixed results. The Confederates did well on this attack. Their one-to-one -one drove this brigade back and caused it to lose a step. This one was a straight exchange, so Campbell had to be flipped and the Confederates had to flip a brigade. Now, that can be serious for the Confederate because once you're flipped on the first day, you no longer can attack. You're kind of shattered. So, um, very bloody battle here on Hers Ridge. Uh, let's see what the Union can do in reaction. So they'll be doing the 10 a.m. turn. Okay, that's the situation after the Union have moved for the 10 a.m. turn. Now you can see the they've got a nice good linear line here, and they've got a bunch of units coming up fast up here too. So they're stabilizing their line in the McPherson's uh, Ridge vicinity. The Confederates have got one unit dinged and another division coming up. So it's going very historical, and I can see that by the use of the line markers there, the game has subtly changed, especially without the stacking. Let's do another couple of turns and see how this goes. Okay, the Confederates, wanting to keep up the pressure, are now taking some chancy battles. I think we've got a one-to-ones all the way down the line. We'll see how they go. Um, they were just able to close, and they don't have the greatest odds, and the Union are on higher ground in some cases, which means they'll be adding one to the dice. So on these die rolls will depend a lot. If the Confederates push the Union back, they'll be okay. If they're repulsed with losses, they'll be in bad trouble. And over on the right here is that shattered unit, which of course can't attack. So I'll do the attacks down the line and we'll see how they go. Okay, against Devon's Brigade, they got an exchange plus attack or retreat. So Devon's Brigade is destroyed, but Archer's Brigade has been shattered and is thrown back. So it's going to be very costly. Let's do this next battle, which is um, Pegram's Artillery and Brockenborough for six against Wadsworth, which is six. So that's another one to one, but he's on higher ground, so the Confederates are going to have to add one to the dice. What's the result? Well, the Confederates rolled an A1, and they'll take the loss off the Pegram's Artillery. That's going to be serious enough. Now the next battle is Pettigrew at 9 and Cutler at 7. Again it's a 1-to-1, one -one, but 
he's going to add one because he's on lower ground. What's the result of that attack? Okay, the Confederates got an AR and A1, which means that unit is shattered. Now, this is one thing about the intermediate game. It does have drastic results. If the Confederates don't do well in the early morning, they can, um, well, they can be damaged permanently. For example, let's look at it. This unit is shattered. This one's shattered. It's upside down, and that one's shattered. So virtually, Heath's division has one single brigade left that can attack Brockenborough. So the only fresh division they have in the immediate vicinity is Pender. And what the Union have, they have a heck of a lot more brigades. So the Confederates are in bad trouble. Because you can see here, one, two, two brigades here, artillery coming up, and another brigade in the immediate uh, vicinity will be up in another turn. So um, let's go another turn or two and see how this goes. But you can see how serious losses can be on the first day if the Confederates take them. Now here's the odd thing about this game, and it is historically accurate. It just looks odd. As we know, the Confederates concentrated faster on the first day, which is why they outflanked the Union on the right here and eventually caused them to... Uh, evacuate, retreat through the town. But in game terms, the there are actually more Union on the board than Confederates. Granted, the Union are way on the south end of the battlefield and they have to march to it. But the march times in this game are very liberal, so these units come up fast. And on the ground, we only have Heath's division, now shattered, and Pender. It will take early coming in from Harrisburg and Rhodes coming in from the Carlisle Road to change the situation. But uh, let's see how this goes. Okay, this is the situation after the Union have moved for the 12 noon turn. Now I might point out that with the new rules too, you can use the battle line markers to bend your line too. That's one thing I really like about using the battle line markers. But in our situation here, the Union is strong enough to actually just stand and counterattack here, and they've pulled a counterattack here against shattered units. I suspect the Confederates are going to be in a very, very bad way. Let's see uh, what happens after Union rules for their combat. Also note that the 11th Corps is coming up fast. And there's just a gap here. There's nothing. So um, the next Confederate units don't really come in. Two more artillery units, Garnet and Pogue on the Chambersburg Road. And Rhodes Division up here in the Bendersville Road. But only at 1 o'clock. So we're going to have a power vacuum here where there will be way more Union on the board than Confederates, and that can be a problem. Okay, in that first counterattack here from these two Union Brigades, they got an exchange and a defender retreat, so the Confederates lost an artillery unit and had to fall back, and we uh, cut the Iron Brigade in half. So, still favorable for the Union. They're on high ground holding a good strong line. And we've got Rowley counterattacking here, five against a four, it's one to one. He's got higher ground and he's attacking a shattered unit, so this probably won't go too well for the Confederates either. Nope, that attack didn't go very well at all. Defender retreat and lose a step. So this brigade, Davis, is just smashed to pieces. It's right off the board. So the Confederates are in a very, very bad way. Let's uh, do another turn or so and uh, we'll see what Pender can do. Probably just damage control. Okay, that's the situation after the Confederates have moved for the uh, noon turn. And uh, I'm going to end the video there because I think I've seen what I want to see. And then I'll make some comments. So what they've done is Pender has come up here and short up the whole line. Done a very linear line, brought up Pogue and Garnet's artillery. And they have a very good defensive line, but offensively, not so good. The Union are well in hand now with these brigades coming up. They'll be able to go into line. They'll be able to easily form a line here. And the 11th Corps coming up, too, is going to be able to shore up the Union line considerably. Um, I'm almost tempted to do one more turn. Maybe I should um, do the 1 o'clock turn and see what uh, happens when Rhodes comes on. Okay, I'll do one more turn because... Uh, Roads coming on could make a subtle difference, but I don't think so. So let's carry the turn, 1 o'clock, with the Union moving. 
Okay, that's the situation after the union have moved for the 1 p.m. turn. And it kind of confirms my worst fears. And uh, the game went very much like my other practice games. Now, it could be my style of play, of course, but I'm playing the union conservatively, just making a defensive line, and they can make a defensive line pretty readily, almost too easily, because before Rhodes even comes on from the Carlisle Road here, the 11th Corps is already deployed and ready for him. And when Early comes here from the Harrisburg Road, maybe it'll make a difference, but he doesn't come till the next turn, 2 o'clock. Even then, you know, he has four moving points, which means he'll be kind of in this vicinity. Now, there's still a game here. There's no question, and it is playing out very historically. But a more aggressive Union commander, I think at this point, would actually be able to counterattack and do a lot of damage, which isn't quite the situation the way it was. I'm almost inclined to think that the Union, with these new rules, would have to be backed up maybe one turn to make the game work. But I do like the way the battle line uh, markers work in the intermediate game. But let's do one last turn, absolute last. We'll get Rhodes's division on. But remember, it's only got four moving points. So he's not going to be able to deploy very well on Oak Ridge. But let's see what he can do. Yeah, it's as I suspected. Rhodes won't be able to make a big impression because uh, the rules state you have to come in and call them with each unit paying one or being one moving point behind the one in front. So Rhodes is only able to deploy in line two brigades, and that's not going to be much of a threat. At this point, a highly aggressive Union commander could actually be attacking Rhodes before he even gets on. So um, the battle line rules have subtly changed the game, and maybe, um, I won't say broke it, but it's, it's just a different game. You have to decide for yourself whether using the battle line markers and no stacking is um, worth it. I'm not so sure. So let's do a summation and uh, that'll be it. Okay, so this variant, which they call the Gettysburg Compromise, is a compromise between the advanced game and the intermediate. It does add the nice battle line markers, which is really cool, but it has subtly changed the game. Without the stacking, I'm not sure the Confederates can concentrate properly to break the Union. It's still fun to play, but I think the game comes down to a lot of low odds attacks for the Confederates, and uh, if they don't get the right die rolls, the game is skewed in favor of the Union. So I enjoy playing this, and uh, this will give you an idea what the variant is like. Intermediate Gettysburg, a game I still have great affection for, but I don't know. The game isn't 100% there yet, and being a creature from the 70s, you know, and kind of forgotten, I don't know if this game will ever be the game I want it to be. But um, that's it for the um, Gettysburg Return and uh, this variant called Gettysburg Compromise. Thank you for watching.